this fall, we've been focusing as an organization on the Old Testament, and our uh, theme has been called Confronting Old Testament Controversy. So we've talked about things such as, uh, is the God of the Old Testament evil? Did the Exodus really happen? Were the Israelites polytheists? That was last week with Sam. And did Moses write the Torah? We've been doing that every week. Um, and so now this is our current topic. Why is the Catholic Old Testament bigger? That's um, sort of wrapping up the semester, looking at, you know, if you're a Protestant, other denominations have um, larger Bibles than you. And if you're Catholic, other denominations have smaller Bibles than you. Um, and if you're an Orthodox, you have the biggest Bible of them all. So um, I don't know if we have any Orthodox. We'll take a show of hands maybe later. Um, so this, this we're wrapping up the semester on. I'll also be talking about the Second Temple period in general because a lot of the uh, Catholic deuterocanonical books come from this the period of uh, Jewish history called the Second Temple period. So we'll be focusing on that as well as um, the general question of the, the Catholic Old Testament. Um, now we're just going to do a brief recap. So, um, for, so the first week um, we talked about, as you may recall, but if you're not here as a recap, um, how did we get the Old Testament? We talked about the text of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, this will be sort of important tonight, but I'll recap what's important so you don't need to worry about remembering that. But we'll refresh this for sure um, in this presentation for the week one, the textual criticism, the formal name for it of the Old Testament. Then second week and third week and fourth week, we all talked about Genesis and related issues. Um, Genesis 1 through 11, then science issues surrounding Genesis. Then the fifth week, we talked about the historical exodus or non-historical exodus or what have you, the um, weighing those the evidence for that. Then we talked about the Canaanite conquest. Then we talked about did God command genocide? Connected with that, we also had a, a guest lecture by Father Thomas Joseph White that was hosted by the TI um, talking about the, um, the death of the firstborn. So that was a lecture we also um, had in October, if you remember that. Okay, so now today's message, I have to give a full disclosure. I'm a Catholic, so um, this is uh, brought to you by... Um, not the church, I'm not an official representative of the church at Rome, obviously, but I'm a Catholic, and so I'm not, I think we've only had Protestants represent so far this semester, so I'm the first Catholic this semester, um, and well, so you might hear a different perspective. And so here's the brief roadmap I'm going to follow um, with, um, with this. It's not going to all be Catholic propaganda, if you will. Um, it'll be, we'll have other things mixed in. So we'll, we'll start off, um, we'll talk about, just introduce the general, the general area, talk about the, what I'm going to talk about, the issues surrounding that, why this isn't even an issue. Um, then I'm going to give the context. This will be the historical context for the Second Temple period. Um, and so this is talking about the history and the Jewish history, specifically what happened after Babylonian captivity up till the Roman period. So I'm not going to go into the, um, the period of uh, the Jewish state under Roman rule, um, so not the New Testament period, because that's New Testament history. But I'll talk about the history of um, Judaism up to that point. And then talk about the content of the deuterocanonical books, talking about what they have, what they don't have, things like that. Um, then last, I'll end on the topic that probably will get the most fire, and um, that is the canonicity of the deuterocanonical books, because I can already see from looking at the room that a lot of people will have disagreement. There's a lot of, you know, a fair, a fair split between this room. That's good. That's really good. And so what I'm hoping is, um, because this is our, like, last, you know, like, heavy topic meeting before, before next week, to get this to be a discussion meeting. So you all definitely feel free to pipe in and disagree with me, yell at me, I mean, nicely, hopefully. Um, but to, to chirp in and then um, to, to promote your own viewpoint or disagree with me, um, but then also, you know, engage with each other. So I hope this will be a heavy discussion meeting, so definitely feel free to, you know, just interject. Um, raise your hand if you can, but also just feel free to shout something out if you want to, and we'll get to you, and we will hopefully have a very fruitful discussion about um, the canonicity of the, these books and, you know, hear different perspectives in here. So I'm, I'm hoping for that, so you all definitely feel free to do that. Throughout the whole presentation, too. I mean, probably the only place that doesn't lend itself to that is the historical context. But even then, just um, just join us. Oh, uh, okay, cool. So we've had several more people join on Zoom. 
so far. I'm, just, I'm seeing that. All right, so now I'm gonna hop in right into the introduction. And for those of you just joining on Zoom, I'm just gonna briefly introduce the topic area right now. Okay, so I said we were gonna have a lot of discussion tonight, and um, so this is our first try at that. So what we'll try to do is have a mix of in-person and Zoom discussion. So if you have something to say on Zoom, type it into the chat, then I'll read it aloud from up here. Um, and we'll try to go back and forth on that. Um, but first of all, just for um, brief discussion, this is a you know sort of pop quiz for y'all. How well do y'all know the deuterocanonical books? You know, if you even know what term that is. If you don't, we'll get to that, and that's okay. But I'm just to to judge what people know. We'll we'll pose a few questions here. So in the Catholic Bible, you know, it's bigger than the Protestant Bible, um, smaller than the Orthodox Bible. So how much space do deuterocanonical books take up in the Catholic Bible? If you um, anybody have a guess? Space, like, I, I set a Bible in front of you, like, how thick are the, not like inches, but, you know, relative to the rest of the Bible, I should say. And, um, you know, is it like the size of, of one, you know, one other book in the whole Bible, or is it, you know, half the Bible? Um, if that makes sense, that question makes sense. You? Okay, well, we can start with the number of books. How many? Seven. Seven, Seven books, you're right. Anybody have any, even just random guesses, like is it, you know, the, the size of an epistle, the size of a, a minor prophet, or the size of, you know, Psalms, which is huge? The size of a gospel, maybe. The size of a gospel? That's a good guess. Syriac is pretty big. Syriac is pretty big. Syriac's like on the order of at least Proverbs, if not bigger, I think. So, how, so this is a, something to ponder. And the, the answer is, it's actually roughly the size of the New Testament. So it's roughly, you have this chunk of books that is almost as big as the New Testament. So unfortunately, a gospel is like, I mean, um, I don't know how big, probably, you know, less than 25% of the New Testament for sure, but probably around 10% of the New Testament. So, it, but it's, it's pretty sizable. So it's this chunk of books that, it's a sizable amount of books that you're putting in there, or that you're, um, that you're removing if you're a Protestant. So it's not something to be taken lightly either way. Um, and you, um, so, so that's the, that's the general thing we're talking about here. Um, I wish I had a Bible to sort of show y'all, but they don't, if you had an Anglican Bible, if you, if anybody has Anglican connections, you could probably actually see this, it'd be pretty cool to do, because the Anglicans normally, I don't know what they do today, but they used to put them in an appendix in the back. So if you get an Anglican Bible, you can look at the appendix and then sort of measure yourself to see how much space these take up, and that'd be an interesting experiment to, you know, um, sort of um, adventure. Oh, you have one? I've got my new American Bible. Oh, cool. Do you, does that, like, have them in the, an appendix in the back, or does it? No, they're, they're, in they're, they're incorporated Catholic. into the Old Testament. Yeah, that's the normal way for, for yeah, that's definitely how Catholic Bibles do it, um, because they are seen as canonical by Catholic. For the Anglicans, there's a weird, they have a weird place in the Anglican canon. They aren't really canon, but they aren't not canon. Um, sort of weird, I don't know how to describe their theology behind that. But because of that, they put them all in an appendix. So you can actually see the size of them relative to the rest of the Bible. Including in that um, the additional parts of Daniel and Esther? Yes, we are. Um, relative, though, to like most of the Bible, the Daniel and Esther would probably be pretty small relative to the rest of the deuterocanonical books. Yeah, probably a few pages. It really, I actually have a book down there. I can't reach it, but if y'all want to see it afterwards, it's it's a commentary on those editions, and I'll, I'll talk about those later. But um, there there are some additions to other books in the Bible, but those probably take up a relatively small amount. It's not um, the, the actual books that are added or, or you know subtracted um, using those terms interchangeably are a whole lot more. Um, okay, so pop quiz. So all together, see if we're or even one person, if one person can do it. Um, this will be hard for, I think, both Catholics and Protestants because Catholics generally don't know what they have that Protestants don't, and Protestants don't know what Catholics have that they, that they don't have. So who, who can name all of the books? You, you got it? <laughs> I got it. It's cool. First and second Maccabees, Topic, yep. Judith, Sirach, Baruch, Wisdom. Cool. Yes, that is correct. Yes. Do you know? Okay, we're going to extend this a bit. What are the other names for Sirach? Wisdom of Ben Sirach? Yes, that's one. Ecclesiasticus. Yes, boom, you got it. Okay, we'll get to what that's important in a minute. Um, yeah, it's not really that important, but it's important when you're reading like old 
documents because you think you'll win the world. Um, okay, so now here's a bonus question. Um, can anybody name a book, and we can even try to name a few books, that are in use by other Christian denominations? Um, and what I'm thinking about here is, like, not Mormonism, not, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses that add on, like, an entire, you know, other Bible, but other, other people that use the correct baptismal formula, we'll say, um, who, um, who, what? Jubilees, yes. Um, and do you know which denomination has this? Ethiopians. Yes, exactly. So the Ethiopians have Jubilees and Enoch. Um, and then Zach put in the chat, I should probably open up the chat to the side so I can see what people are, are saying. Um, yeah, we, um, yeah, Zach said uh, Bell and the Dragon, and then some, some Orthodox have first through fourth Maccabees. I know it's more common just to include third Maccabees. I don't know which Orthodox include fourth Maccabees and which one don't. So that's a, that's, and I don't even know which orth, if the Orthodox would tell you whether they, like, which Orthodox do that or not. So it's, it's also sort of a minor issue for, for fourth Maccabees. Um, for, um, isn't there a third interest? Um, fourth. Esdras gets interesting. Yeah, so there are there are those, and I'm not exactly sure. Again, to, to use a broad term, orthodox, probably some orthodox sect um, includes that, but I don't think it's necessarily, and sometimes Esdras includes like Ezra and Nehemiah, so it um, it depends on where, um, I believe it's it's first and second Esdras that are normally like Ezra and Nehemiah, but sometimes there are, there's more, com it's more complicated separating out the books, and I'll, I'll talk about that more later. So that wraps up our first part of the discussion. So here's what we're discussing. I hinted about this earlier. So the, um, what I know as a Catholic is the, the Catholic Church's statement on this, which is from a church council called the Council of Trent. And as a rough outline for people who might not know, um, Catholics believe that church councils give inspired, um, make inspired decisions on church doctrine. And so... This is one of the decisions that the church has made on the canon of the Old Testament and the New Testament here. Um, but really, they just listed out the Old Testament in the section I copied. Um, so you can see, and I'm just going to quote from this. Um, it's that the council says they receive and venerate with an equal affection of piety and reverence all the books, both of the Old and New Testament, seeing that one God is the author of both. So you know that whatever they're going to list below, they see as equal to um, the, the, every other book in the Bible. So they're not placing any of the books below on a lower, lower on the totem pole, if you will. They're not saying, eh, maybe on any of these. They're, they're saying really strongly that these books are included. And then they say, and it is thought it meet that a list of sacred books be inserted in this decree, lest a doubt arise in anyone's mind which of the books are received. And then they list all the books here. So there are a couple interesting things I want to point out here. First of all, I bolded the ones that are the deuterocanonical books that you don't see in Protestant lists. Um, and these are only the Old Testament books, by the way. So these aren't, this doesn't, the New Testament does not have any additional books. I'll clarify that right now. Um, there's all Christian denominations agree on the New Testament um, and on the New Testament canon. But the Old Testament canon, this is where you get these seven um, books that there's disagreement on. So you see here, um, but you look here, like Ecclesiastica. So um, Syriac was said, but it's also called Ecclesiastica. So why are there these different names? And the answer is that books don't come with their, or that manuscripts don't come with the name of the book written on them all the time. So generally you, you don't have solid agreement on what to call a book. And that's why also you see weird names and names that are spelled differently, even though this is, you know, older English. Um, but it's hard to tell what some of these books are, even though if you looked at it for a while, you could see, like the book of Esdras, what, that's probably Ezra, um, but it's also the, you know, because it says the second book, which is titled Nehemiah, but sometimes they're just combining the first and second Ezra's. Um, and what else is around here? I mean, obviously, Canicles of Canicles, which is the Song of Songs. Um, and then the four books of Kings. So that's weird. So what's happened here? Well, that's because they considered... Um, and then two of Para, Parapolmenon. I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, basically, in the entire six books, that's the two books that we call Kings, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, and then First and Second Samuel. So that, those are the modern names to them, but they're sort of weird names because they differed um, in what they were called. So that, that just is a forewarning that if you see strange names elsewhere, it doesn't mean that somebody's like adding on 
or an old council had added on or changed books in the Bible, things have changed. You know, it's the same book, just a different name. Um, and this is what we're discussing. So this is a pretty hefty claim, especially if you're a Protestant. You're probably thinking, oh, like this is, they're saying these Deuterocanonical books are actually on the same level as the rest of my Bible. What does this, what does this mean? Um, and so this is what we're going to be discussing tonight. So this has caused a lot of debate throughout history. Or throughout, I guess, last 500 years, not throughout history. It's been a very small amount of time, comparatively. So now, I've been using the term Deuterocanon, Apocrypha, things like that. So what does this all mean? I mean, you're, there's probably um, some people that haven't ever heard of these before. And so I've been using terms that are very confusing. So um, if that's the case, I apologize right now, and I will fix and re, you know um, fix my, my error and help explain these, these vague terms to you. Um, so when I say Deuterocanon, I mean books that are included in the Catholic canon that are excluded from the Jewish canon, we'll get to that later, and also generally from Protestant canons. That's what I mean by when I say Deuterocanon. Um, it technically means second canon, um, and so this came into play with the Council of Trent. It's come into play a couple other times through history, but it mainly came into play with, it, um, with the disagreements of Protestants because they relegated books, the Anglicans did this, they relegated the Deuterocanon to second canon, whatever that means. So that, that's a label that's used for these books. Um, for Catholics, this means it's a second canon, but they, the second canon has the same weight as the first canon, so it's all one canon. Um, there's really no second canon explicitly, but it, they're, they're canonical still. Um, so then, yeah, so technically means second canon. Then Apocrypha is a popular term used for um, de the Deuterocanon, but it technically means books that aren't in a canon. Or if you look at the actual um, history of the term, it means a hidden writing or something like that, um, which it really doesn't apply to these books at all because these books aren't, don't really fall under the name Apocrypha. It's sort of a derogatory term that was labeled on them a few centuries ago. Um, and, but um, scholars will tend to still, sometimes scholars will still tend to use Apocrypha to this day. And I'll explain how that is in the next slide. Then there's the term Pseudepigrapha. Um, this means that um, roughly writings that claim to be written by a famous prophet, apostle, or figure, but they're not. So an example of this, um, is the Gospel of Thomas. So the Gospel of Thomas, we know, is a few centuries after the first century, was written a few centuries after the first century. There's no way it could be written by the Apostle Thomas. So it's clearly a pseudepigraphal writing. Nobody thinks it's actually written by Thomas. Um, and it's clearly also somebody, it's not just another guy that happened to be named Thomas writing this book. It's somebody claiming to be the Apostle Thomas. So this is a pseudepigraphal writing. Um, Here's, a, here's on the term Apocrypha, since it's so commonly used, so um, what, what does this mean? So it is primarily used by Protestants um, and in, in scholarly works, which some of which I'll mention in a few minutes. Um, they'll use the term Deuterocanon slash Apocrypha when they're writing. Um, so if Catholics believe that their scripture, is it appropriate, you know, either to be respectful or to, um, or as a Catholic yourself, is it ever appropriate to call these books Apocrypha? So this is a, this is a good question. So what do y'all think? Um, both from Catholics and Protestants, do y'all like think we should call them apocrypha? What do y'all want to call these books? I think apocrypha is confusing because there's all those other books like Bell and Dragon that are also called apocrypha, and so I think it'd be confusing to use that characteristic and think what Catholics do in the same. Yeah, that makes sense. Anybody else? So we you said it specifically means hidden writings. Yes. I'm not sure if that... Yeah, why are they hidden? Who are they yeah. hidden from and by whom and why? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I would use that term. Right. I mean, I don't think they're hidden. I mean, they're right there. <laughs> <laughs> they're not locked up in a, in a safe somewhere. Yeah, so, so those, are, those are two good reasons, I think, to, to avoid it, is that it's confusing, you know, regardless whether you're a Protestant or a Catholic, and it d doesn't really mean what it says. Um, so, you know, avoid it if you are writing technically, I would say. Um, but I have another suggestion, so yeah, don't, don't, don't use it because it just, it also doesn't convey what you're saying um, with meaning hidden writings. It, it's one of those cases where if you use a more technical and precise term, you'll come off as sounding more intelligent. Um, and so, you know, that's just a piece of advice. But then there is one exception that I should pray, that I should note, that if you say apocrypha to the Hebrew Bible, is somewhat accurate by today's meaning of the term apocrypha with however that means hidden writings in whatever sense you, you want to use it. Because these books aren't, 
a second canon to the Hebrew Bible, um, to the Bible written in Hebrew, which I'll get to later. This doesn't mean that, like the Bible of Jesus' time, that they weren't a second canon, um, but they, um, that to use the term deuterocanon to the Hebrew Bible is a misnomer because these books were written in Greek. So it's, it, I think it's okay to call them apocrypha to the Hebrew Bible, um, and I've seen that in, in articles and things like that. Um, that just is a sidebar, but in general, I think it's best to avoid the term apocrypha and stick with deuterocanon. So that's what we'll be using tonight. Um, but if for whatever reason you have, you know, uh, theological objections to that, feel free to use apocrypha, and we'll try not to be offended by that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I said that. Um, it doesn't contain the Catholic deuterocanon. Um, and it might even be more respectful in this case. It, it would be disrespectful to call them the deuterocanon of the Hebrew Bible because that's trying to impose your canon onto the, to, onto the Jewish um, community today. So, Okay, here's the list um, that we talked about earlier, but I've put them in color so you can see them uh, better, and you can see the different genres of them because it's not just one genre. It's not like that we've added in, or we're dealing with here a whole genre of gospel, say, or a whole genre of um, wisdom literature, things like that. So here's all seven books. Um, the genre of the first two, Tobit and Judith, is tales, so they tell a story. Um, this is sort of, if you think in your, um, if you're a Protestant, think about the story of Ruth, sort of along those lines. I mean, obviously there are um, literary differences there, but it's that that's a fair comparison. Um, and then wisdom and Sirach, or Ecclesiasticus, or the wisdom of Ben Sirach, any one of those three, are wisdom literature. So, you know. From the name wisdom, you can you can see it's wisdom literature. So thinking about this, in, you know, if you're used to the Protestant Old Testament again, this is like um, Proverbs or Song of Songs. Eh, Song of Songs is different, sort of. Um, Ecclesiastes maybe, um, and um, and and Psalms too. So so the general wisdom literature, which is in the middle of your Bible, if you open it right to the middle, you'll pop right to the wisdom literature. So um, then the Baruch and Letter of Jeremiah. These are um, these belong in the prophets, so they belong with Jeremiah. So think about the book of Jeremiah. That's the genre of these, um, of Baruch and the, the letter of Jeremiah, obviously. And then first and second Maccabees are history. So these are like first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles, things like that. Obviously still different in style, but if you think along those terms, you'll, you'll come to a similar, a, a generally right area. And um, then you have the additions of Daniel, addition to Esther, and those are whatever genre you want to put on Daniel and Esther. Um, so Esther's more of a tale, I guess, and um, Daniel is several things. Um, but you, you know, that we'll, we'll talk about the, these, these additions, but they don't differ from Daniel and Esther themselves, really. Um, so what's not in the Catholic Deuterocanon? canon? Um, so, well, you don't see, like, you know, Jesus with a lightsaber described in the Catholic Deuterocanon. canon. That's not what we're, not where we're having. Um, we, uh, you don't see this painting. Um, this actually just came up when I looked up, um, I think, apocryphal writings. And it, it came up with this, so I'm like, okay, this is what people will think of when they think of apocrypha, I guess. Um, and so, so what's not? So we mentioned a lot of these at the beginning, but Third Maccabees, Psalm 151, the Orthodox have an extra psalm. Uh, asterisks on this, the Catholic, some Catholic Bible numberings and some Protestant Bible numberings don't match up for the psalms but their content is the same. So don't get worried if your Catholic Bible looks different in numbering than the Protestant Bible. It's, it's the same, they just, the numbers are different, so it's okay. Don't get, don't start to fight over the psalm numberings. That's such a minor issue, and there's internal debate over that within both denominations too, so don't worry about it. Um, but the Orthodox do have one extra psalm, um, to make that clear. The, um, then there's the Book of Enoch, which was mentioned, it was the Ethiopian Orthodox. Um, there's also Book of Jubilees with that. Uh, and then nobody, I mentioned the Gospel of Thomas earlier. This is a New Testament, a New Testament writing that somebody proposed should go in the New Testament, and but nobody accepts it because it's pseudepigraphal, clearly not written by the Apostle Thomas, teaches things contrary to the rest of the Bible blatantly. So um, this isn't nobody's Bible. So these aren't, these are not in the Catholic Deuter canon. Um, and of course, many more things. You could pick any random book from the library. It's probably not in the Catholic Bible. Um, so, just had to say that. Um, so then, talking about then what I'm going to um, discuss later with some textual issues. What do we mean when we use um, 
these textual terms. And we talked about this in a, a few in a past meeting, so some of you may recall these terms. But to go over them again, when I say the Masoretic text, what I'm talking about is the Hebrew and the Aramaic text of the Jewish canon. So this is the, um, the text, the, the Hebrew text of the, um, the Old Testament that's shared by all Christian denominations. So if the Old Testament um, we, we hold today um, of the non canonical books were originally written in Hebrew and then translated into the Septuagint, translated into Greek. So the Septuagint is the Greek text of the Old Testament. So this is um, even the Catholic Old Testament, the Orthodox Old Testament, all of their books are also written in Greek. And so when I talk about the Septuagint, I mean um, the, the Greek version of the Old Testament, essentially. And this is generally a later translation of the Masoretic text, uh, but we'll get to a few, few details on that later. Um, then the Vulgate is Jerome's translation of the entire Bible, um, both Old and New Testament. Jerome, um, this is actually an important source, even though it's not in either, either of the original languages, because Jerome had access to copies that we don't have today. So his input for the Vulgate um, is important because he had access to copies of the Masoretic text, copies of the Septuagint that just aren't around today. They've faded into history, but he had those. So his translation is seen as another source for textual criticism, even though it's in neither original language. Um, so then the, these last two terms are different. They aren't talking about the text themselves, but they're talking about the grouping of the books. So the Tanakh is the canon of the Hebrew Bible. If you can say that the Hebrew Bible has a canon, which today it does, um, or the, rather that the Jewish um, Judaism has a canon, then it is the Tanakh. Um, this was not always the case, but this is um, the state today where the Tanakh is the Hebrew canon. Then the Torah is the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. So you've probably heard about this. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that's the Torah. Those are the central part of the Hebrew Bible. So keep those, those two distinctions in mind. Um, and those are, those are general terms. We'll throw them out again. Here's the resources um, that I'll be talking about in general and that I've talked about so far. Um, the first one, the... That guy right there, the Vanderkam book, is super good. Um, I'd recommend it. He, it's a um, basically an introductory textbook, but it focuses on the apocryphal writings and use that in a broad sense. So it includes books like Enoch, books like Jubilees, things like that. And it focuses on the apocrypha to the Hebrew Bible. Um, so if you're really wanting to dig deep, deep into this topic, I basically just, this, I've relied on this source for most of it. So um, you, you should go and pick up a copy of uh, Vanderkam. Uh, the new Oxford Annotated Bible is also excellent. Um, if you want more info on that, you can come up to me afterwards and ask. OK, so we've been through the introduction. I know a long introduction, but there's a lot of ground to be cleared out of the way. And some of these sections are actually shorter than the introduction. So now we'll move on to the context. So now I'm going to talk about um, the timeline. Um, so this is the timeline of Hebrew texts. So um, we used this in a previ me previous meeting. I'm not trying to accomplish the same goal as that meeting, but I'm just trying to familiar, um, make you all familiar with the same material to say, oh, hey, I've seen this, this timeline before. So if you were here for that meeting, then say, oh, look, I've seen this. Um, yay. It's all the same stuff. Yes, this semester is united. So yes, think on, think on that. Um, and so you see here, um, you have, is it, yeah, ah, there. That was us. Okay, cool. All the animations are done. You see it starts out with uh, Moses, then it goes to the United Monarchy, and then exile. And then Jesus over here, and then this is talking about the, uh, the Masoretes, and that's with the Masoretic text. So I'm not going to go into all the labels in this graph. But if you're Protestant, then you probably have writings in your Bible from here, because Moses wrote the Pentateuch, according to traditional, um, traditional thought, which we've talked about earlier. Uh, but that's a traditional understanding. So Moses wrote the Pentateuch here. Um, then you have the United Monarch here. So this is First Second Kings, First Second Samuel, um, and then First Second Chronicles. And then you have prophets here scattered in here, and then exile, and exile, and this is Babylon, and you don't have um, any writings then until you get the return, which is about right here. So you get the return to. Um, to, to the land, which is in Ezra and Nehemiah, because you don't hear anything for about 100 years until Ezra and Nehemiah come back. And um, then they return to land, and then 
after Ezra and Nehemiah, then you get cut off right here at around five or four hundred. At the date side, unfortunately, I don't have in front of me. I don't want to say it wrong. Cut off right here. So you you end with um, what is it in the Protestant Bible? Malachi, I believe, is the last written book, um, and this is said to be you know the last word before Jesus came. If you're a Protestant, that then there was this period of silence you, you hear between. In this period, so so nothing said from from here to Jesus. There, there's nothing right in here, and this is the second temple period, which I'll be talking about. And this is where the Deuterocanon was written. So if you're a Catholic, you don't have that theology. You think that God was still speaking in those years, and you have those books in your Bible. Um, so this contributes to also a, a theological debate as well. Um, but the historical context is that in between the exile and Jesus was a period called the second temple period, and this was. Um, this relates to the period of the rebuilt temple under Ezra and Nehemiah. So you read these in both your Bibles, or same Bible, but you know, in in whatever canon you choose, you have Ezra and Nehemiah. And you read about Ezra and Nehemiah going back, rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, rebuilding the temple, and that was destroyed by Babylon. um, Because Babylonians came in, destroyed the Temple of Solomon, um, which the the Jewish um, religion said was um, very glorious, you know, gold everywhere. Um, you know, it was like heaven and earth, essentially, that first temple. Um, wonderful place. And then you get this. I mean, this, of course, isn't an exact second temple, but, you know, something like this. So this is impressive, but it's not the, you know, golden temple you think of when you think of the first temple. Um, and so it, the second temple was built. It really didn't live up to the expectations of the first, but it was central to um, the Jewish faith through the time of Jesus. This was then destroyed over 500 years later by the Romans. So this temple right here, again, not the exact temple, this is a replica, of course, um, but it was destroyed. It lasted for half a millennium. So just think about that. You have a period that not many people talk about that lasted half a millennium. So that's like we didn't talk about from the Reformation until today. I mean, that's a huge chunk of time. So this, this period is really important. And if you understand this period, I'll be trying to say you understand the New Testament, you understand a lot of things happening after, you understand hit world history a lot better. Um, if you understand, uh, especially the Jewish community during this time, because the Jewish community was also important for the Greeks, for the Romans, things like that. They were minor, more minor when you're looking at Greek and Roman history, but still significant because Palestine was a very important land to control. Um, so, yeah, this is the context of Jesus, the apostles, Paul, and the earliest church fathers. So these guys lived around the time that the Second Temple um, was around. Um, And it was so so significant, too, that you see in the first century, you see in the Gospels, that when the Second Temple was destroyed, people thought it was the end of the world. Because when this has been around for 500 years, suddenly this is destroyed, people think it's the end of the world. So this is, um, you see this in first century writings, you know, in the Gospels, too, but also in other writings as well. Um, So that's very important. Then here's a, here's a timeline that can help, help point out what I'm going to be talking about. So I'm not going to be talking about the Babylonian captivity. That's a different lecture. I'm going to be talking about the, um, I'm not going to be talking about Rome. That's a different topic. That's like, both of those would take up a, a long amount of history, but they're really um, not central to the issue of the Deuterocanon, because the Deuterocanon was written in this period. It was written in the Persian um, period, so when Israel was under Persian control, it was written in the Greek period and under the, um, the Jewish state or the Hasmonean state or the Maccabean state, whatever you want to call it, which I'll get to later, in a, or like next slide, I think. So I'm not focusing on Babylon, I'm not focusing on Rome, on that period um, where the Second Temple was built, but before Rome came along and um, conquered, uh, conquered Palestine. So here's the Persian period. So this is the story that everybody has in their Bible. Um, it's the story of return told in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, generally, scholars take these books to be a historical source. Um, this isn't an issue like the Exodus where um, there's you know, a whole lot of debate over whether there was any history to the Exodus at all, um, as we talked about you know, several weeks ago. But this is an issue that scholars generally take these books to be reliable historical sources. Um, the chronology, though, of some events is really not clear. You see... Sometimes in the books, the walls are there. Sometimes in the books, the walls of Jerusalem are not. And then they want to rebuild the walls. And you're wondering, but wait, I 
read here that seems to fit in this timeline that the walls were there. So what, what's happening with the walls? What's this chronology? So there's a very confused and muddled chronology. Um, it's hard to work out, but um, the general gist of this that's history is that somehow the Temple of Jerusalem was rebuilt. We know that. And the walls of Jerusalem were restored. And the walls being restored is important not only for the fact that you probably heard if you, you know, heard this in Sunday school class, oh, it was important because, you know, the, uh, the Jews could be safe again, that they didn't have to um, worry about being attacked again. And that's somewhat of the reason, that's the reason that's given in scripture, that they didn't have to be worried about external attacks again. But another underlying reason is that when the walls were taken down, that allowed for more um, interweaving, interlocking with the surrounding cultures, intermingling with the surrounding cultures. So there wasn't suddenly this, this wall of Jerusalem and then other people, you know. You, you have suddenly an openness of other cultures coming in, other cultures coming out. So some scholars look back on this and think, well, then a sect who was opposed to intermingling with other cultures then took over the Jewish state, and so therefore they rebuilt the walls. You know, if you think of today, um, this probably definitely influenced my modern politics, but I've read articles that are very similar to if you think of today what's happening on the border, you know, some people say, oh, no, we should intermingle more with our, you know, southern neighbors. Other people think, no, we should be more dis distinct. So that you can think of a similar issue happening here with the Jewish state. Um, so, but one important thing to think about is even though there's these walls here that, that did establish a clear Jewish area again, this doesn't necessarily mean the intermingling didn't happen. So in the second temple period, you see a very much more, a more diverse set of Jewish people than you did in the first temple period. Um, and, or at least that's what generally is taken that I've, that I've found across, I've come across. So this is important when you come to, to later periods as well. So think about that, keep, in, keep that in mind, that in the second pe temple period, you're not talking about people who have been, their family's been Jewish, they've been Jewish for, you know, you can count for the last you know, 300 years or something, or you know, since the Exodus, they'll try to trace the genealogy. No, some people may be converts, some people may be even not Jewish and living in Jerusalem. So what's happening there? So this is the type of, you can imagine the type of politics that arise from this. Um, and now here is, now after Persia, so Persia had a great empire, um, and then you probably recognize this guy. This guy is Alexander the Great. I almost don't even need to talk about him because lots of people know what he is, but I will just in case. So he, in his lifetime, he went from here in Macedonia all the way to here, and he conquered this entire area. So just a very impressive dude. Um, I mean, that's clearly undermining him. I don't know why I said such a lie statement about this guy, but... I almost don't even need to talk about what he did because it was so just in, in under, you know, 15 or 20 years, that entire area was now um, under Greek control. And that is the story of Alexander. Um, but Alexander only lived to be about 30. And then he died with this thing um, that you see, this, this huge empire. So suddenly the leader of this dies. So what happens? What in the world do you do with this huge expanse of land that was under the control of one guy and who basically was a dictator of this entire area? What, what do you do with it? I don't, you know, you, there's not an easy solution, and there wasn't. And so um, then you get the, what's this say, Macedonia? Um, this is actually the Diatoka. I don't know why this um, is titled that way. But anyway, um, so this is, then you get the period of what's called the Diatoka. The Diatokai is Greek for the successors of Alexander. So his successors, his generals, all battled over this, that whole area that you saw, and that still is under Greek control, but then it was divvied up. So you see, um, especially here, here's the uh, Ptolemaic kingdom, roughly in Egypt. Here's the Seleucid kingdom up here. And what do you see right in the middle of these two, in the, in the middle of the Seleucid kingdom, in the middle of the Ptolemaic kingdom, these two the two largest kingdoms in size, well, you see um, you see Israel. So this is um, very important for Israel. And this is, um, this, this is what also drives a lot of the Second Temple history. Um, and is this, this interplay between the Seleucids and then the Ptolemies. And then you'll finally see that the Jewish people use this to their advantage and overthrow their... Um, their, their Seleucid rulers and become their own state. And they sort of, they, they use this 
um, this, this fight over territory that was weakening both states to just say, okay, fine, we're done. We're on our own state now. Um, we'll get to that soon. Um, so this Greek period, as I was saying, um, Alexander the Great conquered that huge area you saw. You saw how big it was. Um, again, you probably already know about that, so I almost don't need to mention it. Um, but the term that's used by scholars for this is Hellenization. So um, the entire world, the entire known world at that point, of course I don't mean to speak pejoratively towards, um, you know, Eastern Asia or, you know, further Western Europe, but Alexander conquered from Greece to India, which is a huge chunk of the world as we know it today, too. So um, what was the world as it was known to, to a lot of people at that time was under Greek control. And Alexander did a very interesting thing in his lifetime where he mixed just enough of the elements of the native cultures in with Greek culture to allow the native cultures to feel friendliness towards Greek culture. And so that they wanted to become Greek. They weren't resistive to the idea of becoming Greeks themselves. So these native cultures wanted to, um, to start speaking Greek, to start doing Greek things, because um, Alexander had had made a move that made that, um, and how he conquered it, um, that integrated their culture well enough into Greek culture so that they could adopt Greek culture as well. So this is called Hellenization, and this is an important fact uh, for, for Israel. Um, and then in, in Judah, and, and, um, and for the Jews in particular, you, you see um, two, two empires, as you saw, having control over it. So the first, um, the first kingdom that had control was the Ptolemaic kingdom. So they were under what we'll call Ptolemaic rule for the first part of their, um, their history after Persia. So they were under rule from Egypt right here, um, from the Ptolemaic kingdom, which it's headquartered in Egypt, if you think of it that way. Um, and then they, then they later were under control of this kingdom right here, which was the Seleucid kingdom. So then they were under Seleucid control. Um, and under the Ptolemaic control, an uh, important thing happened. The translation of the Septuagint happened. And this was, however this happened, the general idea was that the Greek speakers in Egypt were trying to procure more and more books translated into Greek so they could have bigger and bigger libraries of books. And because of this, they wanted a translation that they could read of the Hebrew scriptures because they saw them as important. So for whatever reason, um, which historians debate about, the um, Jewish scriptures were translated into Greek for the sake of the um, Ptolemaic rulers. Um, and so this was important because, like I said, everybody is now speaking Greek in, um, over the whole known world. So now, because the Jewish scriptures were translated into Greek, everybody can read the Jewish scriptures, even if they are outside of Israel. Um, and so this, this um, centers the, the, what was once, and now is still called the Hebrew Bible, but now instead on the Greek language. So suddenly, everybody's reading the Bible in Greek instead of Hebrew. Um, and I say suddenly, you know, this happened over a century or so. Um, but you, you have um, people reading the Bible in Greek instead of Hebrew. Uh, the, the actual story for this, um, so I don't know, how many of you know the story of the translation of the Septuagint? Um, the one? Okay, okay. This is worth then recapping because it's sort of a fun story. So the story was that um, that the uh, ruler, um, the rulers in Egypt, in Alexandria, um, wanted to expand the Library of Alexandria um, to include all the books of the known world. Um, and so the, um, so they then realized that the Hebrew Bible needed to be part of this, the Bible that the Jews were using, the Jewish Bible, um, in other words. They realized they wanted the Jewish Bible to be part of this library. Um, but then they knew that because it was such a big document that there would be so much disagreement over the translation. So what they did, they, um, they commissioned 70 independent translators to go into private rooms and to just translate the whole, the whole scriptures by themselves. So they locked them in rooms and they, so the story goes, and they said, okay, translate this into Greek. They gave them the Hebrew text and said, translate into Greek. And then uh, when the translators were done, all 70 of them came out and their translations were exactly the same, supposedly. <laughs> so, you know, when I add in the word supposedly, that really makes it less, um, Less impressive because it it's not that impressive because the story is not true, but that's the um, that that's what that's actually what many people thought though that the Septuagint was 
translated precisely the same by 70 independent sources. So, of course, it's God's translation of the Bible. So this is why the Septuagint was ranked so highly, um, because people thought it was the translation, you know, the divine inspired. It's, it was the KJV of the, of the, um, the Old Testament of the, of the Jewish people. So commissioned by God. Um, that, so that's what happened under Ptolemaic control. Then under Seleucid control, you have Antiochus IV, also called Antiochus Epiphanes. Um, he is recorded horribly in the text of First and Second Maccabees. Many horrible things are said about him. Um, the Jews do not like him, and that's because he um, ransacked Jerusalem, ransacked the temple, and defiled the, defiled the altar, um, and basically chased the Orthodox Jews out of the city. Um, it's, so he's painted very harshly in the Old Testament, but actually he wasn't that harsh of a ruler if you look at what he did historically. So you know, from a historical standpoint, which is what we're talking about right now, he, the real reason why he did this is debated, but it's thought he did it more um, because of that reason, because of the wars with the Ptolemaic Empire, um, that he thought it, you know, ransacking the city could get him more money for his wars in Egypt, rather than a angry move against the Orthodox Jews. So he's not this horrible ruler necessarily, but it, it did harm the Jewish people, and you know what he did was a horrible thing there. Um, but but maybe don't think of him as I, as tyrannical as Maccabees paints him necessarily. Um, and then you get the, because of um, Antiochus Epiphanes, this called her, caused a revolt. So suddenly, most of the Orthodox Jews run out of the city, and they're um, fighting this guerrilla war against the Greeks. And it was led by um, Jewish Maccabeus and his brothers, um, and hence this is also called the Maccabean state. Um, it was called the um, Hasmonean dynasty, because Hasmonean um, was, the, was the family name, rather than... Um, Maccabeus. Maccabeus actually is a nickname given. It means the hammer, I believe. Um, so, it, so calling it the Maccabean state is only named after Judas rather than the whole family, whereas in reality, this is the whole family line which controlled the state. Um, and essentially what you have here is then the, Maccabe or the, the Hasmoneans also control the high priesthood, and um, they establish a dynasty controlling both the priesthood and the political um, life of the Jewish state. And so this is where we'll, we'll taper off um, for the history of the, the Second Temple context. Um, I guess I'll pause there, pause on that side, and see if there's any questions about this. I've just dumped a lot of information. Um, any questions on the Second Temple history? Um, anybody? Um, going once, going twice, cool. We'll, we'll move along. Um, and if you're thinking about this and want to come back later, just let me know. So then we'll talk about the dating of the Deuter canon. So I just gave you a whole bunch of history. So without throwing out exact years for all of these, because the exact years are debated, and I would have to put like three for each one, um, or periods that mean nothing if you're just looking at years. Um, I'm putting this in roughly what period at the, of the ones I just talked about these books fit into. So you'll see that in the Persian period, you have Tobit and Judith, so those two books of tales. Um, in the Greek period, you have Baruch, but some people think this could be earlier. Um, then you have Syrac, or Ecclesiasticus, or Wisdom of Ben Syrah. Um, then Hasmonean period, you have, obviously, first and second Mathemies. Um And then the Roman period, some people think that Wisdom was as late as the Roman period. But again, some people think this could have been earlier. Um, so Wisdom, in terms of our, our canon debate that we'll have later when everybody's um, up in arms against each other, um, wis the dating of Wisdom really isn't that important. Um, so that, that doesn't matter. But what about Baruch? So if Baruch is in the Greek period, but Baruch claims to be written by Baruch, who is the um, scribe of Jeremiah, then Jeremiah was before the Persian period. So doesn't this mean that Baruch wasn't written by Baruch? And how can we have Baruch being dated to the Greek period and still have a consistent version that allows Baruch to be considered inspired, inspired scripture if you're Catholic? Uh, so this is a this is an interesting question. Anybody have any ideas on that? So do you get the problem? If if Baruch was written like 200 years after Baruch lived, is this an issue for Catholics, or is this not an issue? And if not, why? It's not an issue. Why? I mean, we're not even sure if the Pentateuch was written by Moses. Mm. We're not sure if Song of Songs was written by Solomon. Mm. It's a pseudonymity. 
pretty standard in the Old Testament. Uh, although it's a source of concern whenever we're reading the Gospel of Thomas, isn't it? To say that this person claims is claiming to be Thomas, but is not clearly not. I think that is a source of concern. Because that means that they're trying to make a claim on theological truths that perhaps they don't have the credentials for, if you will. But isn't, isn't Thomas the one that sort of is considered a Gnostic text? Yes. Yeah, I don't think the concern is so much that it's not written by Thomas as what it actually says. So I, I don't think you can say that the other books of the Old Testament are pseudonymous. Most books just don't give any, any claim to their authorship, and we may ascribe authorship that may be debated. But the, the issue is that if you have, I mean, as a Protestant, put my Protestant cards on the table, um, if you have an inspired scripture claiming to be written by person X, um, falsely claiming, having a false claim in the scripture is clearly a problem, right? Yeah, so that's, a, that's one issue to raise. But those, those are also good issues. So if Moses didn't write the Pentateuch, then or didn't write that, um, yeah, the, the Pentateuch, then is an issue that um, Baruch didn't write the letter, or the, um, a Baruch. So, yes, it does. Yeah. Aren't there three Isaiahs? Isaiah. Somebody else, I want to give an answer on that, but I... There's a tradition of being three different authors of Isaiah that all claim to be Isaiah. Is that a yes. tradition within the church, or is that a scholarly? I don't remember. Saying because of how there, there are differences within the text of Isaiah, like oh, it seems like we can split it up into three different sections. I think Isaiah is an issue like that, um, and I don't want to talk more on that because I could say things, but I don't know if they'll be accurate. Um, but I know that Isaiah does have that issue where there are multiple different strands of authorship. You also see this like in the Gospel of John, so this actually is an issue with the Gospel, um, is you see different parts of the Gospel of John that are seemingly not written by the same author as the other parts. Um, and the Gospel of John is less of an issue because it's some stuff like hymns or stuff like poems, things like that, you know, John 1. So, um, but, but with things like Isaiah, you see a very similar, um, similar controversy there. So you, you have this in other books. That's, so that, that's a really good point. So the question is, though, this is still a concern. So how do we resolve this concern, whether you're Protestant, whether you're Catholic? Well, I'll just go back to this slide because we talked about this earlier in the semester. Um, so this actually deals with the book of Jeremiah and deals with Baruch, Jeremiah's scribe. So we think normally when we think of inerrancy, or we think of inspiration, rather, we think that the inspiration process goes from God to Jeremiah to the book of Jeremiah. That's what we think. Um, it's this clean, nice, linear process that happens, and it just is like magic, that God just puts divine thoughts into Jeremiah's mind, and Jeremiah writes out the thoughts exactly as they are. Exactly, no drafting, no, no misspelling on the page, you know. He, he wrote um, you know, an A and V instead of an E and V by accident. He, he doesn't do that. It's exactly, you know, word for word what God speaks in his mind. No, no first, second, third draft. So this is a nice, clean picture of inspiration. But obviously, as you know, we've inflated this, there is a drafting process. There, there are first, second, third drafts, presumably. This just isn't how God works in the world as we know it. And it really wouldn't make sense for him to. Um, so, so here's the, the case study. I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to read this again because we already read it. But the gist of it is that Jeremiah didn't write the book himself. He has a scribe named Baruch. Oh, hey, Baruch you know, the same book that we're talking about here. So this works out well. Um, I'm going to give a shout out and thank you to Zach because he made these slides. So these are not my own, just so you know. These are Zach's slides, but I stole them because this is the exact issue that we're talking about with um, the authorship of Baruch. So same issue here, and it's actually the exact same for the case study. Um, so what happens here? So God tells Jeremiah to preach his word, now to write it down, and then... Jeremiah outsources, and he gets Baruch to write down for him. He writes it down in the first scroll. Then the, um, the king burns the scroll. And so then he writes down another scroll. And then we have the second scroll. 
Okay. So, and then Brook added many similar words. So Brook's adding things to what Jeremiah said. Um, sidebar, could this be, you know, Brook itself? I don't know. That's a, that's a question for the textual scholars, but maybe it could. Um, so maybe the book of Jeremiah actually has Brook in mind, too. I don't know. This is a, I'm going down on them here. Um, but possibly it does. So you have this process, which isn't the clean process we talked about. So, um, so this is less of a clean process, but you see the same issue applies for Jeremiah, and then you have other authors other than Brute, or other um, scribes other than Brute following later in time that could have copied and transcribed the book as well and added in you know, some additional details or things like that that could make the book be dated later or you know, written later in some parts than um, what it was originally said to be. So this isn't, if it's, my point here is that if it's not an issue for the rest of the Old Testament under your, your view of inspiration, it's also not an issue for the Catholic Deuterocanon for um, the Book of Baruch being 200 years later than it claims. Um, if it, in fact, is 200 years later than it claims. And some people debate this for the reasons that I just noted that, you know, maybe the Book of Jeremiah mentions Baruch itself. Um, so this is, um, this is a, the general answer to that sort of objection there. So now we've talked about the context, um, wrapped up that, um, that sweep of the Second Temple period. It was a really quick one. Um, now we'll get into the content. So hopefully this is um, sort of what you came here for, talking about what do these books contain? Well, if you're Catholic, you already know. If you're Protestant, you may have no clue, and that's okay. Um, I don't know if we have any Orthodox. I'd guess not. Um, I think I know what everybody is. So I'm not going to speak to Orthodox here. Um, but here's a question. Is there new doctrine in the Judah canon? What do you all think? Is there... And take this however you mean. Is there new doctrine in the Deuter canon? Yes. Yes, why? So if you put a bunch of given texts on the same level, then you're also going to be using those texts to interpret the other texts. You're going to want to make sure that there is consistency between them in terms of all the doctrines they teach. And so although there might not be any... Uh, completely new doctrines, I think, that if, it, if there is a major influence on a particular interpretation... Um, more context for the other doctrines. Uh, what? Is, is, are you saying there's more context for interpre interpreting what you find in the other ones? You, yeah, you're giving yourself more context, and if that context sways you between one interpretation or the other, uh, then that might be a source of concern. Yeah, so it might contextualize interpretation at the very minimum, right? I said yes. A very qualified yes, so basically no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yes and no, that's a good answer, question mark? <laughs> Thank there's you. some like purgatory yeah. stuff Maybe. in there. Oh, purgatory stuff, okay, that's an interesting one. Maccabees. Purgatory stuff, Maccabees. Um, okay, so we have one maybe, purgatory stuff, whatever that means. Um, <laughs> And any other, is there a new doctrine, like, do, do we have the doctrine of the Trinity, the Deuterocanon? No, no, we don't have the doctrine of the Trinity. This is the doctrine of the, does the Deuterocanon say to worship Mary? No. <laughs> I have, no, I have everybody yeah. so. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Um, does the, oh, what were some other silly things I could throw? I've heard every, when I've talked to Protestants about this, you know, from, actually, you know, for my whole life, even when I, when I was a Protestant, Protestants would accuse the Deuterocanon of having all sorts of things in it, you know, like the fact that maybe baptism was salvific, or um, that the that the Deuterocanon said to worship saints or things like that. And the Deuterocanon does not say to do any of these doctrines explicitly, and doesn't even hint at most of what it's accused to hint at. Um, and most of what it's accused to hint at aren't even Catholic doctrines. So you have this whole spectrum of people of things that people accuse the Deuterocanon having that. It, just doesn't have. Um, but here's a, here's a better way to say that, um, as, as Sam was getting at. And I hope, Sam, if you would disagree with this, maybe you can quibble on the wording a bit. But I think this is what you were getting at. Um, so there are no revolutionary paradigms introduced in the Deuterocanon. Everything contained in the Deuterocanon is in some way based on the rest of the Old Testament, in some way. Like, this is, this is pretty broad, but we're not introducing, you know, we're not saying suddenly, you know, let's call God a woman in the Deuterocanon for whatever that could mean. You know, we don't suddenly have, um, wait, whether or not we can call God even male is a different issue, but we don't have suddenly, you know, this different, um, different account of the Deuterocanon. We don't suddenly have, 
other gods introduced into the Judo canon to worship. Um, and so, so that's how I would, I would say it. Um, in other words, there's not a new religion, a new Judaism espoused in the Judo canon. This is important to, to note there isn't like a, a Hebrew Bible Judaism and then a Judo canon Judaism. No, the Judo canon really is Jewish, and it is Jewish writers writing, for the most part, even Jews today would consider probably, Orthodox Judaism. You get Hanukkah from the Judo canon. So it's not heretical Jews that are, um, that, that are just writing down whatever they, they want to say. Um, they're, they're writing Orthodox Judaism. Whether or not it's inspired is a different issue, but there's nothing that contradicts Judaism as we see it. Um, that I see in the Deuteronomy canon. Maybe, maybe a Jewish person, if they were here, would, would disagree with me um, on some things, but I really don't think they would. I, I don't know. Maybe, I'd, maybe I need to ask them about that. Um, but it seems to me that they, they're venerated in some way, venerated maybe too strong of a word, respected by um, the Jewish community today because they do tell the story of things like Hanukkah. Um, another, here's like a very clear example of this. So you have the additions to um, Daniel and Esther. So I'm going to talk about these for a bit. You, in the Catholic Deuterocanon and in the Orthodox Deuterocanon, or other Orthodox books that are known as Protestant Bible, um, you have additions to the books of Daniel and Esther that aren't in um, the, the Protestant Bible. So I'll talk about Esther first. In Esther, the additions are just rehashing of the Esther story. And sometimes they're verbatim copying of other parts of the Esther story, but just copying it in a different place. So you have maybe something from chapter two that's copied verbatim in now chapter four, say. So it, it's literally word by word, or slight changes in the grammar just copied again elsewhere. So these additions to Esther don't, they, they clearly don't add anything new. They're just editing, things like that. Um, it's even unclear, you know, what significance they really have in the canon debate. They really don't have much significance if you ask me when we debate about canon because it doesn't, that there's nothing new at all added to Esther, just as emphasis or narrative or literary moves or things like that, um, that, that is just editing. Um, and Daniel, you have similar things too. You have some, some things that are just rehashing the same thing. Um, but in Daniel, you also get, for instance, Daniel is thrown into the lion's den a second time. So have, everybody's watched Betty Tales in here, right? Where Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. So I guess in the, if you're Catholic, then we need to make a Catholic Veggie Tales of Daniel and in Part 2, where Daniel gets thrown in the again. Uh, poor Daniel. This is still fun, just as fun as the first time. Some things are slightly different, but it's, it's basically the, a rehashing of the first time. Um, so, you know, how do you interpret this? Was Daniel, in the Catholic view, actually thrown into the lion's in a second time? So some people think so. Thomas Aquinas thinks so. So, you know, it, you shouldn't dismiss that view. But it's also not a view that is, in my view, a hill to die on. You know, I have a life to live. I'm not going to dedicate um, the last 50 years of my life defending the fact that Daniel died or that Daniel was thrown to lion's den twice. It, it's clearly also just a, in some way at least, even if it was a historical event, a rewriting of the same instance. A very similar thing may have happened again, um, but it was just rewritten again very similarly. Um, so these are, these are a clear example of how the Deuterocanon really doesn't add anything new um, to scripture. Uh, well, just to clarify, we do know that these additions took place well after the books were originally written? Yes. So this is, this is a combination of like, um, this is in the realm of textual criticism. So if we find some things in the Greek manuscripts but not in the Hebrew manuscripts, say, then we know they were likely added on. Um, like there, the additions to Esther are very clearly like Greek additions, also because of the grammar maybe, if you look. I mean, I, I can't read Greek or Hebrew, but I'm told that, you know, you can sometimes tell what language something was originally written in based on the grammar. So if something is grammatically clearly originally from Greek, then this is likely an addition to Esther because Esther was likely not written originally in Greek. Um, so things like that. Um, but some doctrines um, are... Um, that are not found in the rest of the Hebrew Bible, so the Bible written in Hebrew, the Bible that the Jews today call their Bible, the Bible the Protestants call the, the, Old, the Old Testament. Uh, some doctrines not found in that may have some warrant in the Deuterocanon. Um, so what are some of these? Um, so I'm not going to pose a long list because 
people could interpret this a whole lot of different ways. That would just be ridiculous. And I've seen, if you look up Catherine Doctrines and the Deuter Canon, you'll find some reputable sources, but you'll find a lot of junk online. Like when I was first researching this, I found one website where a guy had listed out everything that was supposedly heretical found in the Catholic Bible. And he just had like a verse by verse and had very weird interpretations found of even like additions to Esther. He's like, oh, this edition is heretical because it rephrases this. So very weird, weird things you could get into very quickly. Um, so I'm not going to propose that type of list because I think it's misguided. Uh, but here's a, here's a tentative example which Anne brought up. So praying for the dead in Maccabees. Um, in Maccabees, some people are told to pray for the dead. This is something that you really don't see in the rest of the Bible. So the Catholic doctrine of praying for the dead somewhat hinges on the acceptance of Maccabees. And actually, fun fact, this was why Luther rejected Maccabees, was because he didn't like praying for the dead, not because he thought Maccabees wasn't canonical, and therefore he didn't like praying for the dead. He didn't like praying for the dead, therefore he thought Maccabees was non-canonical. If that makes sense. So Luther's theology drove Luther to take out Maccabees from the Bible. Um, which I'm not going to comment on whether that's you know good, bad. I obviously don't like it myself. But you know you might have a consistent reason for that. You might say, no, praying for the dead is inconsistent with the rest of Scripture, therefore this book can't be Scripture. So that would be a charitable way to put that. Um, but I don't think it is. Um, of course, as a Catholic, but I'm not going to get into that right now. But at the same time, you, you do have this doctrine in there, um, in Maccabees. Okay, and then you also have in Tobit, almsgiving for sin. That some people say um, that if you give alms in some way, Tobit says that um, that can be done as repentance for your sin or as penance or something like that. This is a harder one, and I really don't see it even when I read it in Tobit or when I read it in Tobit, because it doesn't, it seems to be on other passages, at the same ground as other passages in the Old Testament about, you know, when God says, repent of your ways and start treating the poor better. Okay, is that really treating the poor better as penance for sin? Well, maybe if your theology already presupposes that, which isn't inconsistent, it could be, but it doesn't directly mean that almsgiving can be used as penance or something something of that sort. So it, it's, it's sort of a weird way to, it's, it's another weird hill to die on. So I just don't, I don't see this one as well, but some people might see it, so that's why I included it. If anybody wants to add on, if anybody adamantly thinks that almsgiving is or is not seen in that way in Tobit, I'd love to hear it. But I sort of doubt if anybody has thought that deeply about this issue in Tobit. So um, along we go. So again, not like a radically new religion in Tobit or in um, the Deuter Canon, but some specific new doctrines might be in there. And when I say new, I mean that wouldn't be found in your Protestant Bible. So the question is, why now read the Deuterocanon? If there's nothing new in there, and I say that broadly, you know, obviously there is new stuff in there, but, you know, very little new doctrine, so why, why read it? Um, okay, so first of all, there's engaging in reliable history. Even if you're a Protestant, you could read First and Second Maccabees, and most scholars think they're in some way historically accurate, and that's where we get a lot of the history that we know from about the Hasmonean state is from First and Second Maccabees. Um, so this is, um, this is the first reason, and there's... Um, lots of epic military engagements in Maccabees. So somebody dies because an elephant comes and crushes him. Okay, that's that's pretty epic if you ask me. Um, and there's also fantastic stories. So like Bell and the Dragon. Um, there's um, then also you understand the New Testament, and um, how should I say? Um, and by the way, this also applies to Catholics reading non books in the Orthodox Bible as well. So um, I'm telling you that if you are Catholic, you know, don't read it as scripture necessarily, but go out and, you know, explore some books in the Orthodox Bible um, and take a look at those and see what, see what they have in there because they're not, they don't necessarily have heresy in them. They just aren't inspired. You know, whatever your theological view of them is, um, your theological view simply states they're not inspired, not that they're heretical, um, most likely. They also help to understand the New Testament. So, if you, I'll, I'll dare to say that if you don't understand the whole uh, motif in the Book of Wisdom, um, then you of, about wisdom, then you can't understand Jesus in the Gospel of John because the Gospel of John. Um, so, so the chief scholar I'm getting this from is, is Raymond Brown, but he's also the chief scholar on the Gospel of John, 
and full disclosure, he's Catholic, but he'll say that the Gospel of John is based heavily on the Book of Wisdom because it was a, a piece of literature that was widely circulating at the time. And so Jesus is seen as, um, as wisdom incarnate, if you will. Um, he's seen as the word incarnate, the logos, um, but he's, he's also seen as wisdom incarnate, that Jesus is wisdom. Um, maybe the reason why that he was called logos, this is going out of limb, but is, I'm going on a lot of limbs, but I, I hope it's helpful, um, is that um, maybe he's called logos because it's a male term for Sophia. You know, maybe, that, maybe that's why we call Jesus logos, because what the author's trying to get at is that he's wisdom incarnate, but oh no, Jesus is a man, so he has to be logos incarnate, you know. So this is, um, th- that's, I'm not trying to say reinterpret your entire theology based on that claim, but maybe that was what, when the original author was just writing briefly, Maybe that's what he was thinking. He was thinking, oh, Jesus is Sophia. He's wisdom incarnate, but let's use logos because logos is the masculine term for that. So if you, if you want to re- understand the New Testament fully, you have to understand what's in the Deuterocanon. Um, then some pretty pictures. Yes, elephants and um, dragon being fed bread. Yay. Um, there's a, if you, if you haven't read the editions of Daniel, there's a lot of inter- interesting editions there. Um, or what have you, um, whatever you want to call them, if you're Catholic or Orthodox. Um. How about these were an accepted part of the scripture into the into the high Middle Ages, or when sort of, what's kind of their history of sort of appearing and what would be read from? Yeah, so um, I think I'm going to give this later on, but as a brief rundown, just answer that question now, um, in case we run out of time with the discussion at the end, which wouldn't be a bad thing. Um, then uh, it, so they were accepted as scripture tentatively by some Jews in the first century, but to impose, I'll get on this later, to impose a Jewish canon, a canon on Jew, Judaism in the first century is anachronistic. Um, but then you get later, by the time of Jerome, Jerome was on the edge about whether or not to include them. He eventually did. So his inclusion really solidified the inclusion for the rest of Christianity. And there were several church councils that solidified that as well. Um, even into the High Middle Ages, you see some books being disputed by certain monks, certain certain sects, and eventually this results in. But they were they were generally accepted. So that's what I'm I'm also trying to get at is that they were generally accepted throughout the Middle Ages. Um, even though you see, you know, this monastery doesn't accept you know wisdom or something like that. Um, and but but you know, single monastery not accepting something is less of an issue than what happened. You know, when one monk in the you know in the Reformation decides to suddenly reject all of these books. And that's when you get the Reformation, that's when you get the Council of Trent, which was a response to that. And so roughly speaking, most of these books were accepted from, say, Jerome, so about 400s um, to the 1500s. Most of these books were included, but you know, it depends on which monastery you're at. Um, also, you didn't have like full, uh, you know, Bibles were expensive and you didn't always have the full Bible with you at all times. So if a book wasn't included in somebody's copy of the Bible, that doesn't necessarily mean it wasn't seen as canon. It just means that they couldn't afford a full copy of Scripture, say. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Basically the DLC. So it, it's hard to say um, specifically, but generally you see them being accepted. Um, again, with instances of like, you know, one monastery here like clearly rejects wisdom or something, but um, not wisdom capital W, not wisdom lowercase w, to be clear. So here's the genre. I already talked about this, so I guess I'll skip over this because we mentioned that at the very beginning. Um, so talked about content. Now we'll move on to the big discussion. So talking about whether they're canon or not. So this is where y'all can fight each other if y'all want to. Um, hopefully not. Hopefully be kind. Um, but, but fight as long as you want. Um, so how significant is this issue? So on this, you know, I don't know. We probably don't want to play the room game because of COVID. But we used to have a thing called a room game, so pretend this is the room game. Just raise your hand and state your opinion instead. Um, so on this, this line between, you know, the Trinity to guitars and worship or defending your pew at, at church, like where does this, where does this issue lie? If y'all, if y'all, this question. Yeah, Sam. Uh, why is there a triclops? Why is there a triclops? <laughs> that, it's it's uh, the thing between the two. I'm thinking um, exactly. um, has got three eyebrows. <laughs> 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 triclops. He's a triclops. I would say that this is definitely one of the more important issues. One of the more important. Like, yeah, okay, cool. 
So we have more important, and like what level, of, uh, if you want to think of an analogy, it's something that might be as important, where would you put it? I would say that it is more important than the nature of the Eucharist. Really? Oh, so. That has come. That came up the exact last time I gave this presentation. So I will say that Martin Luther will disagree with you. When Luther, you know the story, I think. But so it's not less to you, but for everybody else in here. It's not necessarily more important than the Eucharist itself, but than disagreements about the nature. Of oh no, no. Martin Luther would still disagree with you here. Martin, in their in his meeting with Zwingli, they agreed on nine out of the ten points that they they were set to debate. They agreed on nine out of ten. And the last one was the nature of the Eucharist. Zwingli thought it was just a symbol, and, you, and Luther thought there was um, that it was truly the body of Christ. And the debate ended with Luther banging his hand on the table, screaming, um, no, you can't say that the Eucharist is not the body of my Lord, and then screaming and walking out of the room. So <laughs> this, is, this is how important it I was. I would generally consider myself to be a Zwingli. Zwingli? Zwingli. 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 The fact that it's no new doctrine, maybe it's sort of on the level of sort of how you number the sacraments. Yeah, maybe we want to put it on there. So, like, numbering the sacraments. So, what's a good analogy for that for Protestants? Um, maybe considering your Protestant theology, whether marriage is a sacrament in your Protestant theology or something like that. Mm, yeah. So. Um, then again, if you accept the doctrine of sola scriptura, doesn't it matter how much is in the scriptura? Ooh, yeah. So, maybe that. That goes into what Sam was saying. I feel like it's very important for them. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe for Protestants, this is more important than the Eucharist because Scripture is the nature of the Eucharist. Yeah. The nature of the Eucharist, right? I think it's conceptually important, but the secondary question is: Is it practically important? Hmm. So, as a Protestant, you know, I don't accept the the Catholic canon. However, if Somebody told me tomorrow that I had to accept the Catholic canon. It wouldn't really make any difference, right? But yes, I, I would agree with first. Andrew on this. Yeah, that's an excellent where... point. Like, how can you make this determination until you know really what's in it? Yeah. So, so if it came out tomorrow that we needed to change this, I would say okay, but it's very important that we get this right. I mean, if your assertion is true that there is no additional doctrine, then it doesn't matter. Practically. Yeah, you would still be able to execute Protestantism from the same amount. <laughs> what right? From the same Bible. Maybe not the only way. Maybe with praying for the dead, like, but even then, what would y'all start, y'all start praying for the dead? Okay, you know, that's that's such a big change to y'all's life. Not, I mean, it does have a lot of impact, but it... Doesn't that also say a lot about your uh, view of ecclesiology, um, depending on whether you accept these books? Because the statement of which books are canon says a lot about whose authority you accept. Mm. Yeah, that's what I think the bigger issue is, yeah, accepting exactly. it or not it has to do with tradition and councils and, and yeah, and who, who says what goes in the Bible and which matters because if, if this guy or these guys can say these things belong in the Bible, well then they have authority to say other things, don't they? Yeah, so maybe the the bigger issue here is the issue of authority, and that's why solar scripture ties in. Because what we're talking about here is sola scriptura versus, I put sola Aquinas here, but that was just for symmetry. Um, you know, sola scriptura versus the church's authority. So um, that, that's sort of the issue that would be more important than this, maybe, the underlying issue. Um, I mean, that is it's definitely where the root of the disagreement is, because the Protestant view of the, I mean, of ecclesiastical authority in general does not state, basically a Protestant is never going to say that the church decides what is in the Bible. Right. right. Um, whereas that's a more appropriate description of Catholicism, right? The, right. The church defines the canon. Whereas a Protestant is going to say that the canon develops organically um, and is almost you know, self-evident. Yeah. So it's really a question of what the Bible is. That so, that's a good point. So, what is the Bible? You know, is it a is it the only source of authority, or is it there the church authority involved? And so it These seems are, to me that if that's the underlying question behind how important 
these books are becomes a very important question regardless of what's in the books. Mm. Yeah. Hence the conceptual question. Mm-hmm. Those are all really good points, and um, I think we've had good, good points here. Um, so I'm going to move along because I I really don't have like I, I don't want to ping this down anywhere, but I think what you all have said is generally on the more important side, but there are underlying issues which are probably which probably cause it to be more so than the actual issue itself, maybe. Yeah, it's more like this is a symptom of, of another issue. Exactly, yeah. This is this is a symptom of an underlying disease called Protestantism. <laughs> Did I just say that while being recorded? I don't know. <laughs> what do you mean by defending your view? Is that literally like where you sit? <laughs> oh, I thought this was an issue. When I grew up Baptist, like it was, a, it was an issue. That, uh, <laughs> it, if you don't know what this... I mean, I think Catholics do have the same issue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they they do. Um, yes, unless you go to a stadium church where you don't have pews anymore, <laughs> or unless you go to a medieval church where you don't have pews anymore. Yeah, that's a lot of. I know a friend who lives closer to Dallas. He knows of an Eastern Rite church that has no pews because that's how it traditionally was. Wow. It's yeah, did the Protestants invent pews? Yeah. yeah. Protestants invented pews. Yeah, that's actually kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you might as well sit for some of it. <laughs> I mean, you can sit on the floor in the middle. Yeah. I mean, they would you bring pillows. As a, as a fun tangent before, well, this is totally relevant, but it's a tangent regardless and sort of fun. Before pews came into Catholic Mass and before, you know, before Protestantism, people would just, like, wander into Mass and wander out on Sunday morning and, like, bring in their animals and, and things like that. And, like, I mean, of course, this is in the Middle Ages. Like, things got sort of better with, with Trent, you know, regulating things. But you know, before <laughs> beforehand, it was it was complete another chaos almost because you have the priest at the front saying his prayers quietly and all these animals at the back. Maybe um, if you want that picture for your normal parish life in the Middle Ages. Um, uh, ben, we're yeah. running out of time, so you may want to check the chat. Yes, I do. Um, yes, I saw Jeshua said just a couple minutes ago. It's also important for people who aren't Christians who see the disagreement and troubled by it. Christians need to explain why this debate exists and it doesn't undermine the truth claims of Jesus, etc. So yes, that's. That's true. Um, so yeah, so I'm not talking too much on the issue tonight. This is directed more towards Catholics and Protestants rather than towards um, non-believers, but that is one issue that we might want to, to consider, you know, as we're, we're all Christians. So how do we show that this isn't, you know, a, an issue like, a, how do we show that this, this issue on our, on our canon doesn't, doesn't cause us to splinter off into so many different things, which it sort of does, but it, um, you know, how do we reconcile this issue? Um, so I'm going to, um, we already talked about this. Um, so we are just quickly sort of rapid shoot and also feel free to discuss whatever you want at this point uh, with these. I'm just going to throw out various attempts that Catholics might offer at an argument for why these deuterocanonical books should be accepted. So here's a quote. A random Catholic tells you on the street, the Septuagint was the Bible that Jesus used, so the deuterocanon is part of the Christian canon. Do you accept that? Do you reject it? Yes, no. The Bible, though, is would have been a little bit anachronistic mm. with Jesus. He had the law, and he would have the prophets, and he would have had the, the stories. It doesn't change any of sort of what the law would have been. That's a great so point. You've got a lot of you've got a lot of various writings that were sort of in the Hebrew tradition that were translated into the Greek. But how, how Jesus used them is a little up in the air there. If we think about Jesus as a good Jewish, sort is a, is a good Jewish man. Exactly, and that's a, that's exactly the point that you might say to this. So, you know, you, what what Bible did Jesus use? Well, Jesus didn't have a Bible. Okay, um, so oh, of course, he used the <laughs> he quoted from himself in the King James. <laughs> your inerrancy or your inspiration is now a loop, a, a circular loop from the King James back to the King James. So, um, so then here's another, another argument. New Testament writers quote from the Septuagint more than Masoretic text, and Deuterocanonical books are alluded to or cited in the New Testament. Therefore, because the New Testament is canon, the Deuterocanonical books must also be canon. Okay, bam. Any other objections? <laughs> this is just rapid fire for like these. Um, Book of Jude quotes Enoch, if y'all want to know. So just because something is quoted, what I'm trying to highlight here, doesn't mean it's scripture. I mean, when I'm talking about theology, I quote Lord of the Rings all the time. But I, mean, Lord of the Rings is <laughs> I mean, Lord of the Rings is close enough to scripture. Might as well call it. <laughs> I mean, that's true, but. Yeah. <laughs> so. so pagan philosophers talking about scripture. Exactly, Paul. Tradition doesn't make it text. Right, and also you can 
there are historical documents quoted all throughout the Bible. So that doesn't make them scripture. That just means they're good pieces of history. Um, so yeah, that, um, that, that's a good response there. Okay, so here's the last one. The church fathers and the church most of history regarded the deuterocanonical books as inspired scripture. Therefore, the deuterocanonical books have the same status as other canonical books in this important regard. What do y'all think? Better than the other arguments. Better, okay, yay. <laughs> there are a lot of other things that the church has done that we don't feel the need to accept. I mean, uh, I, I think that's, 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 <laughs> the core, that's the core tenet. Yeah. <laughs> that's the yeah. core tenet of Protestantism is that, like, oh, the church is yeah. definitely going to get a lot of these things wrong. Exactly, yeah. So this, so this is the argument, though, that I, I tend to lean towards. So um, I, I think it's hard to come up with an objection against this sort of thing. It does boil down to more of that kind of disagreement rather than disagreeing about these books. Um, but assuming this argument is valid, meaning that the data is right in this argument, it's a sound argument that you can accept, I think. So, um, or rather, assuming it's sound, it's valid, or something like that. I, I think a, a lot of Protestants would be more comfortable accepting any one of these individual books than just accepting this argument. So in a sense, it's kind of the other way around in a lot of ways. That's yeah. It's back to the old joke, really. Is sort of you have the thorny theological question, and you've got a, you've got a, um, you got a Baptist, and you got a Catholic, and you got a Methodist in the room, and finally they just can't agree. So the Catholic says, "Well, church doctrine says this, so that's what's true." And the Baptist sort of puts down and says, "Well, the Bible says this, so that's what's true." And the Methodist says, "Well, I think." <laughs> that's, that's a really good good way to put it. <laughs> I'm not going to object to that. Any Methodists <laughs> in the room that want me to, to say strong words against me, that? Me, okay. actually. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Um, okay. Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to hit on this briefly after that argument. This is mainly to say this slide, you can't get the Deuter canon from the Dead Sea Scroll canon, whatever that means. I just want to highlight this. The Dead Sea Scroll, getting a canon from the from Qumran um, is confusing. Um, so I can go into what the Dead Sea Scrolls are later, but we're running out of time. So in general, just know I've seen multiple Catholic sources who I won't call out because I'm being recorded say this, that somehow the Dead Sea Scrolls prove the Catholic canon. No, you, it's unclear if the Dead Sea, if the Qumran community even had anything remotely close to a canon. So no, this, this is just a bad argument. Don't, don't say this. It's a, there's important data here for the argument because there, these texts were found in the Qumran community, but whether or not they were liturgical texts is a different question. Sort of like raiding somebody's library and claiming that they believe every word of every book in their library. Exactly. It, it doesn't... It, like, raiding somebody's library can help you lean towards what this Qumran community might have believed, but even if the Qumran community believed one thing, should we accept what they believe? I don't know. There's some random Jewish community. Um, who knows? So helpful data, but not like slam dunk argument, which some people try to make it. Um, so just this is generally interpreting Dead Sea Scrolls is hard to do. So just generally try to look into that before you use it for an argument. Um, OK, so here's what was just said. So I'm going to rush through this, that um, both Christianity and Judaism were primarily text-based, but canon is a Christian concept. So ancient Jews didn't necessarily have the concept of canon. Um, can't say whether the text the Jews used in liturgy or that text that they say defiled the hands, um, meaning they were sacred, resembled anything like a modern canon. Um, some say that they, the Sadducees and Pharisees differed. Some don't even think, even think either of them accepted the canon, aside from um, the Tanakh. Um, so what's generally agreed, though, is that rabbinic Juda Judaism um, in the end of the first century, beginning of the second century, was the first that would try to produce a Jewish canon. And this was somewhat in response to the Christian canon. Um, you know, you see in the 200s, this specifically, um, so that it became more evolved in the 200s. This is where you see it in its most evolved form. The takeaway here, though, is projecting a Christian concept of canon onto the Hebrew Bible is at best anachronistic. It's like we said several times already, you can't do that. The ancient Jews do not have a canon um, that we can interpret today. Um, and so this applies to both sides. You know, you, 
proving what the Jews had as their canon doesn't prove what Christians should have as their canon. Obviously, the Jews do not include the New Testament as canon, so that argument doesn't hold water, you know, for the New Testament. Um, so that's that's what I'm going to get across there. Um, Council of Jamnia. I'm going to breeze over this. It's not a thing. If you have questions on it, we can talk about it afterwards. Um, it's just to look over it. It's not a, not a thing. Um, so it maybe was a thing, but it's not the thing that people think it was, is generally what I'm saying here. Um, but just spelling that, if you thought it was a thing and you want me to expound on that, come to me afterwards. Um, so here's the real issue of, um, of canon. So what makes something canonical? Well, there are a lot of different things. It's inspired? Okay, maybe, but you know, somebody's sermon on Sunday can also be inspired. Their sermon isn't canonical. Um, we don't say that. Is it inerrant? Well, I can come up with something, some statements which might be inerrant. You know, like F equals MA. Well, F equals MA is inerrant, but this has an error on it. But, you know, um, suppose, you know, mathematical statements. Um, 2 plus 2 equals 4. That's an inerrant statement. That's not a canonical statement, okay? Um, so just because something is inerrant doesn't make it a canonical. Is it authoritative? Well, okay, well, the, you know, not really. I mean, for Protestants, maybe. I don't know to the Protestants room if you would say this, but I don't think authoritative is necessarily a good word for, for using the term canon, or for basing the term canon on. It's used in liturgy. So maybe this is closer to it. So if you use something in liturgy, maybe we can call it canon. Okay, so maybe those last two are more on the box, on the docket for use looking for. Here's a, here's St. Augustine's taken on Christian doctrine, um, which is the central, um, or was among the first text, and well, I shouldn't say among the first, but it was an early, earlier text on how to interpret the Bible for Christians. So if you want to, if you want to rephrase the title, it's St. Augustine's and how you should read the Bible. And this has been influential for both Catholics and Protestants. And it's probably the most significant book apart from the Bible in Christian biblical interpretation throughout the entire history, um, throughout Christianity's entire history, is St. Augustine's book here. So what we should take, what he says should be taken to be um, valuable. And essentially what St. Augustine argues is that the canon is based on teaching by the universal church. Um, so this is my statement, or you could, if you're a Protestant, just substitute church there. Um, you know, with, with a capital C, but meaning like some abstract church. Um, I would say that Catholics have an easy answer to this. Protestants do not. So, obviously, St. Augustine, I think, generally fits better with Catholic ideas than he does with Protestant ideas. Protestants are probably okay with that. Um, but I think Protestants should, you know, consider maybe St. Augustine's right here and consider, well, maybe what the church accepts is what the canon is based on, and that's as far as we could get with defining canon instead of all these different, these different terms here. Answer to this, uh, but that depends on the existence of this universal church, yeah. which is not the same between Orthodox and Catholic and Ethiopia. So, yeah. So I mean, they have it. I will say, the differences in canon and the small differences you see between, say, Catholics and Orthodox, disregarding Ethiopians because they're so small. Um, it, the differences you see in Canada there are pretty small compared to Catholic and Protestant differences, and I don't necessarily think that, um, you know, obviously as a Catholic, as a Roman Catholic, I think that what Rome, what the Roman Catholic Church says is the correct canon. But at the same time, I don't necessarily think you have as large of an issue in debilitating on um, whether what the East accepts as canon versus what the West accepts as canon. Um, are, are both inspired, you know, decisions by the Holy Spirit, because if it's only, the, the differences there are even more minor than the differences between the um, Catholic and the, and the Protestant um, canon. The, those differences are huge. Um, so what I would say is that if the church has made inspired decisions over time through different groups of Christians getting together and being inspired by the Holy Spirit, then maybe that should be taken into consideration um, in deciding what's canon. And the Orthodox so, conception of the universal church is much more similar to the Catholic position than the Protestant one is. Yeah. Um, and I, so I, I don't know, I think that's a good question, Sam, but I also don't know if debating like Third Maccabees is as significant as, um, I think that's a different debate entirely or a different argument um, than a, in a disagreement over, um, you know, Catholics having an, an answer for the universal church because both Orthodox and Catholics accept there is a universal church that proposes the canon. How they interpret the universal church is a different issue, but it, and generally they interpret it the same way, with maybe exceptions like Third Maccabees, which
which is, I mean, there, there are lots of reasons why you can accept third MACUs. Yeah, so I mean, this is all going to come down to Augustine's ecclesiology, right? Mm -hmm. and, and Protestants definitely don't follow Augustine in those areas. Uh, I mean, it, Protestants really like Augustine. We like him for his soteriology. Um, but we tend to not, you know, not be swayed by the ecclesiology. So, I, I mean, and that's really what this issue comes down to, is in, in order to even, for this to even be kind of relevant, first have to accept the ecclesio ecclesiological assertion that you know the universal church is you know is basically defined as the administrative structure of the uh, of the Roman Catholic Church or you know you know combined with the, the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, whereas that, I mean that's just very foreign to, to what you know, what we're talking about in Protestantism. Whereas the universal church would just be you know, the sum totality of all um, believing Christians, you know, living in the community together. So, I mean, the the question is, do Protestants have an answer? Yes. I think the hard question, the really hard question for a Protestant is, uh, is to what extent are you, you know, if Catholicism is part of the universal church. So Protestants would disagree on that. Or disagree on, um, well, I mean, that's complicated. But uh, you know, it, it, how, how do you how do you understand whose voices are to, together combining to define the canon? Right. That is a very good point. I haven't thought about that um, before. That that's an excellent. You know, Catholics make up one over a billion people, and Protestants make up. I think on the order of a few hundred thousand. So, you know, if you're talking about the universal church, shouldn't that be taken more into account for, you know, for? Sorry, yeah, a few hundred million. Sorry, I I said totally different. A billion and a few hundred million. I wrong order of magnitude. Um, a few hundred million. Um, so you know, like ten or sorry, twenty to thirty percent of you know the Catholic population, uh, with our, is the size of the Protestant population. So, you know, maybe that should be a consideration for Protestants if the universal church is, it's not by popular vote, but. <laughs> this is like the electoral college, come on. You've got to take the whole thing, not just the. <laughs> um, but I. <laughs> right. <laughs> So the, the, you know the, this is an issue of popular debate, but it is, it's food for thought. And thank you, Andrew. That was really helpful um, for that. So because I see that we are running much over time, I will um, skip through the objections, even though that, and we can talk about those after in discussion, and skim to the resources. And then these are all resources you should read. Um, if you want heavier reading, here's some resources to dig into. Uh, here's even further reading if you want to. And then here's some takeaways that we can end on. So first of all, like I said, we cannot and should not project a Christian concept of canon onto the Hebrew Bible. Um, the second takeaway is that the Second Temple period is interesting and a very important time period in Jewish history. Um, if you want more about this, N.T. Wright has a good series um, on the Second Temple period that relates to the, New Testament, the, to the New Testament. So definitely check out his work if you want to talk about if you want to hear more about the Second Temple in general. Um, and then the Deuterocanonical books do not offer a new religion of any sort. That's another thing I want to end on. Um, they might offer a few new doctrines, but they don't offer like any, or you know, a few might smaller new doctrines. They don't redefine the trend. So, and with that, thank y'all.